Welcome to the Artcasters 168. We're feeling great. 168. Yeah. Uh, I wish I could. <laughs> we, need, we need to get we need to get Mike and Gaz on to do their 168 song. So. I know. Right. So Mike, Gaz, if you're if you're there in the chats, or if you're uh, if you're you know at some point watching this in the near future, uh, you know, g yeah. give us a little clip of that song so we can. Yeah. We're, we're not here to hate. We're here to create. It's 168. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. So, um, I actually, I really missed that. I hope they pick that up again. Um, yeah. all right. So, so, uh, we are doing this series, um, where we're kind of just having different guests that are going to be in the hundreds anthology number two, uh, since Scott and myself are going to be in it. And we just thought it would be cool to have different members, um, in the anthology on the show. And, uh, tackle different topics that hopefully kind of relate to the stories each guest is working on and stuff. So, um, anyhow, uh, if you're just joining us for the first time, this is a show where we kind of talk shop about the ins and outs of illustration, cartooning, graphic design, and, uh, and we just kind of get into the weeds of, of what it's like to be doing creator own stuff. So, um, all right. So without further ado, um, I'm Joshua Kemble. This is my channel. So if you haven't yet, uh, subscribe, hit that bell. Um, and one of the best things you can do to kind of support, um, what I'm doing is go over to tapas.io, obviously after this is over and search for quarterly stories and subscribe to it and, uh, follow it as it's updating there. And then you can also check out my graphic novel, um, serializing in it uh, up to the current page I'm on at quarterlystories.com. And so, uh, yeah. Um, let's see. So uh, let's go over to you, Scott. Where can we find your work? And let's say I'm like working on my sappy auto bio comic and I'm like, I really, really need to uh, to find some assets for free um, for my comic. Where, where would I go to get that? Well, Josh, you can go to CircWorks.com and you can download the Comic Maker Starter Kit. It is a digital pack, pack full of digital pack, pack full. All right, uh, it, yeah, it, it's it's pack full of you know digital brushes, uh, comic book templates. Uh, what else? Um, fonts, comic book fonts, all kinds of stuff for making comics. Totally free. Uh, you just go there, uh, sign up for the mailing list, and if you're on the mailing list, then you will also be uh, by virtue of being on the mailing list you will get additional free things as i put out new newsletters and everything but the main thing is you get that and you can start to uh, start making comics i love it and um if you guys haven't yet um i haven't even been able to watch it yet but definitely go to scott's channel if i'm sure everyone who's subscribed to me is already on on his channel but if you haven't checked it out yet um go check out his, his, his last YouTube video. Um, it's, I think going to be really cool and inspiring and uh, a little bit vulnerable, which is like my favorite kind of stuff. So yeah, it's uh, kind of a real one, but yeah, I'm excited yeah. about it. I'm excited about it. I think that's a good, I'm not so excited, but <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just excited about, um, Transparency, no, you know, like I oh, think yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that kind of thing's good, and I I have a suspicion, like from some of the pre-talk, there might be a little bit of that um, on on this show too, which is good. So, because because I do think a lot of the time, you know, like artists will do um, shows and stuff, and kind of make life seem like it's completely problemless, <laughs> and and that can be really discouraging for somebody slugging it out, um, you know, uh, in the ring. So, uh, anyhow, so um. Now we have our special guest, who is um, Peter Palmiotti. He has inked professional comics, uh, like you name it, just pretty much every publisher, um, and is a pretty incredible cartoonist himself. Um, Peter, where can everybody find your work? Everybody can find my work on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, all under Peter Palmiotti. Um, one day I'll have a, a, a website, but uh, <laughs> just find me everywhere online. I'm everywhere. <laughs> nice. And we have your YouTube linked, but um, so you guys can check that out as well. Um, cool. 
so let's let's get into it. Um, so Peter, you're you're in the hundreds anthology. Um, it's it's a really interesting um, challenge this new one because it's you know it's limited to four pages, which is kind of intimidating mm -hmm. in its own right because it's just such a it has to be a short and sweet story. And um, and uh, so do you want to get a little bit just kind of into um, what you're working on for the hundreds, how far you are on it, um, and sure. so on. Okay, cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I just, uh, this this is, I have a webcam, but it's not working for some reason. But um, this is, a, it's a story about a griffin. And I'm doing a side project to the anthology story, which is I'm going to do 100 uh, griffin drawings and put them into a sketchbook. So I've been posting those on Instagram mostly. And in so inside the uh, the one hundreds group as well. Nice. Um, so the story is it's it's a combination of a couple of things I, I just thought of and and sort of meshing it together. Um, you know, I wanted to do something different. You know, it's werewolf and unicorn, but it's all mythical creatures. Uh, so I chose griffin uh, because it, it's an interesting looking. Uh, creature and it's got wings so I, I want the opportunity to really like I just love wings and feathers and you know it's like I could throw so much detail into that and um, so the story is essentially um, he's a protector of a, a small town a group of people um, you know in Griffin mythology uh, usually they, they protect gold or treasure. Uh, uh -huh. there, there goes my camera, but, um, but, uh, you know, I, I figured, you know, well, he's the protector of these, these people he came across one day and, and for whatever reason chose to uh, protect them. Um, so that's an, uh, one of the elements of the story. Uh, another thing is, um, it, you know, he discovers that he's the last Griffin, because um, I wanted to sort of throw an element of um, what was I thinking? Um, just like make it heart wrenching, if possible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like I, I'm really setting myself up for a challenge, um, both artistically and story wise. Um, I figured, you know, it's four pages. Let me, let me throw it all into the mix. Um, and also, uh, towards the end of the story, um, I want him to remember his mother and there's, it, it all ties in together, hopefully <laughs> when I, when I write it all out. Um, I've been working on the story, but I haven't fully scripted it yet. Yeah. Um, Mostly what I've been doing is, is the drawings and sort of uh, deciding upon like the, the elements of, the, of the, my particular griffin that are going to be you know, in the story. Because yeah. you look online, there's like a hundred different variations of what a griffin looks like. Since it's not you know, a real creature, everybody has their own take on it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, so, okay, so when it, when um, I, I think you know, it's funny. I was initially thinking we should just jump into this with inking, but it seems <laughs> a lot more natural to actually just kind of segue from the story to inking. So, so like the story that you're talking about, it sounds mo really pretty fleshed out. Now, when you first, um, you know, were in this anthology, like. Uh, what may what what kind of what helped you arrive at that story? How many other ideas did you kind of go through? And then just roughly like, where do you think it comes from? I mean, to me, to me, this is just an interesting topic in general um, because, and, and I kind of want to hear Scott's take on this too. I think Scott's talked a little bit about how you arrived at the story, but where do you think kind of um, the impetus to tell stories and like, where do you think that comes from? You know, like what, what drove it and, and, you know, um, it does sound like a little bit of mythology and, and outside inspiration and stuff, but um, what what kind of made you land on that? I mean, you you touched on it a bit with 
um, like wings being something that, you know, I agree with you on that too. Cause that just sounds super fun to draw. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause it gives you the opportunity to do a lot of texture and um, really show off. I think a lot of your strengths, but like just in general, like, you know, when you get a project like that, like how long does it kind of take you to come up with a story and what makes you kind of, once you've done that, like kind of hone it down to a specific story. And then I guess after that, just kind of where does it come from? <laughs> yeah. Um, originally I was, kind of maybe going to do a collaboration in a sense with somebody else um this was before like they um really pulled together the structure of what we were going to do you know originally it was going to be six pages and it was a little more wide open to what we could do in our story uh i had an idea to do um sort of a, 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 t a telling of Marvel Comics uh, using a unicorn. Uh, but I, I decided to drop that. Um, like Marshall Lee was going to do uh, like um, sort of a telling of Image Comics uh, originally. Uh, but it, anyway, it's like that. that's what popped in my mind. Yeah. To, to do initially um like this unicorn you know came up with these characters and created mobile comics kind of thing but it was oh, okay. oh, he, you know it, he was like the unicorn represented like stanley and jack kirby combined kind of thing um but yeah i decided uh, i i just want to do um it's like Okay, what, where it comes from is, like, it really comes from independent comics. Um, and, like, I remember seeing, like, a friend of mine show me years and years ago. Uh, it might have been, like, an ash can-sized indie comic that had mm -hmm. a ghost in it. And it was, like, a real heart-wrenching story. Um and I was, I remembered that and I was like, I want to do something like that. And we're doing mythical creatures. Yeah. I remember, you know, I did a video um, maybe a year ago or something using a griffin. And it was like the first time I ever drew a griffin. And I was like, okay, we're doing mythical creatures. A griffin is a mythical creature. I would love to do a four page story using a griffin. Yeah. So, so then, um, I think uh, what initially popped in my head it was like make it make him a, a protector of a town, um, and you know I would derive uh, more story content from that. Uh, but then I thought, oh, we'll make him the last one. You know, he finds out he's the last one. Um, that will possibly be a little heart wrenching, but then the, the topper would be him remembering his mother yeah. <laughs> and hopefully like I could pull it off that it will be something of consequence. <laughs> yeah. And I think that you're, you're really pinpointing one of the big challenges. I mean, like the, the funny thing about, you know, getting into the whole creating thing is just, um, it's like a lot of the time you just kind of have to jump in and then be like, hopefully, hopefully I can make this vision like you know a reality um but it's but it's like it's no fun if it's like completely um easily doable you know where you're just like yeah i can accomplish that you know <laughs> um if it's just a little bit outside of like what you know where you're like i don't know i hope i nail this you know i think that's a that's a good place to be yeah it's like well i i could have come up with something simple that yeah tell a simple story uh but my mind usually doesn't go in that direction. <laughs> yeah. You know, if anything, I make, I make my life not miserable, but just challenging. Like, you know, it's like, I never want to do the simplest thing, the easiest thing. Yeah. I, always, I always like flip it and just, what's the hardest possible thing I could challenge yeah. myself with? 
Yeah, what's what's like a really hard thing to draw like from four different angles? I'm gonna pick a griffin. You know? Yeah. Um. Yeah. No, that's that makes perfect sense, and it does sound challenging. Like trying to kind of balance that. Um. I just want to kind of give uh give a little shout out to everybody in the chats. Um. So uh, let's see. So mighty Pegasus uh is saying hey Scott and Josh, um, and uh. And then um, let's see, Mike showed up. I guess Chris McQuinlan's all is showing up uh, from Australia. So we got a lot of the hundreds. Abe's in there. I hey, everybody. Um, <laughs> so anyhow, thanks for joining us. And if you guys have any questions while we're going, um, please feel free to leave them in the chats because, uh, you know, we, we've said this before, but um, the involvement of everybody in the chats is like half of what makes our show kind of awesome and fun. So, um, yeah, so just let us know if you have any questions as we're going. So, um, so Scott, what about you? Like, I mean, you have talked about, I don't want you to have to talk like again about, um, how you came up with your story. Cause I think, you know, it's, it's based on a, a song by the police and, um, and you're kind of basing it on those lyrics and kind of doing it slightly as like a, 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 bit of a muted comic with possible may have you kind of decided whether you're gonna have te like like words yeah well, I, I, I actually words? started doing some a little bit of lettering there are words but it's kind of like nonsensical if that makes sense basically yeah. so there's the whole idea is like in the first scene there's um just a bunch of just noise going on and the, the dad is frustrated. So even though there's noise going on, he's not really paying attention to who's saying what or what they're talking about or anything like that. So basically that's illustrated just in the background, you see some text and I wrote sort of a script, but then I started dropping the text and the text and there's a couple panels where the text is actually behind the characters. So it probably didn't make much sense to, to type out the whole com that conversation like I did. Cause once I pasted it in, you're only sitting, seeing bits and pieces of words. So yeah. You probably can't make that out, but that's fine because that's kind of the, that's kind of what I'm going for is the dad's not paying attention. So you can't make out exactly what they're saying other than that there's chatter going on. Yeah. So there's that. Um, and the, I guess the only other text is like, um, you know, when we establish where we are, like it'll say either the city or suburbia or something like that. And uh, Got it. that type of thing. And, and there's one other line where it says many miles away, which is basically the part in, in the police song, every time they switch from the, because there's two parallel stories going on. So every time you switch from the story with the dad and it, what he's going through and the Loctus monster, it says many miles away. So that's the only thing I'm actually taking from the song. So yeah. um, I'm not going to put like any lyrics other than just that one phrase. And that'll be, that'll let you know that you're going to the other scene. But I mean, even if I let that out, I think you can tell <laughs> because there's, you know, it's so different between those two kind of parallel storylines. Yeah, that's cool. So it almost sounds like, I mean, maybe a little more text heavy than, but, but kind of taking the approach of like that, uh, that animated movie, the illusionist where it's like, you know, you, you kind of have some sound effects and you have some music and you have a, a few titles, but you don't have anything like super, um, set. Uh, let's see. Yeah. I don't know if I've seen that. Uh, sorry. I was, uh, Mike had posted a link to the hundred days in the chats and it blocked him and was like, approve it, you know, to make sure you're not spamming. Yes, Mike, spam that link. Um, <laughs> that's a good thing. Um, so, uh, so, so like to me, um, before we kind of get into like Peter's done, Peter, are you there? Oh, uh, Peter dropped out. Uh, hopefully let me he'll be back. Can, uh, let me, let me chat with him. Uh, see if he's, you still there? Yeah, he kind of said that in the beforehand that he was having some internet trouble. So yeah, so we just deci we decided to try to kind of work with him on it, but uh, but so hopefully Peter will join us again. But um, if he does, we'll get into like some of his vast experience um, inking and stuff like that. In the meantime, um, let's just kind of dip in this. Um, yeah, I, I haven't heard anything from him, so um, that's going to be rough though, because he probably won't get like a text message online if he got booted off. Um, so let's get into this, um, this topic of, um, of like where 
you think like stories come from in general like because like you know um it, we all have this weird kind of compulsion to like make stuff you know <laughs> like yeah. where do you think that comes from <laughs> like it's just kind of a, a a weird and interesting question to me i don't know a, a lot of it especially for you i think uh, it comes from sort of like just life experiences um, I mean, you tell auto bio stories. My stories aren't really auto bio, but they're a lot of the characters are like amalgamations of different people I knew in life or, you know, based pretty much directly from a character. Names yeah. have been changed to protect the innocent sort of thing and taking because for me, it's it, I, I have to imagine it's the same for you is to write the way to write characters that I know is to either use characters that are somewhat based on myself or if i can put my i if i can say to myself you know my this is sort of based on my friend so how would my friend act in this situation so i always kind of know how they're going to behave um because it's based on sort of like real life people so that's part of it so my story a lot of my stories are loosely based on you know just things that i've either been through or whatever yeah. Um, but then put in, but you know, but then I'll kind of switch it and, you know, it's not real world. It's, it's, uh, escapism. So, you know, throw zombies into the mix and things like that. And of course that all comes from, you know, lore and, and especially like what, you know, kind of what we're doing now with the mythical creatures and things like that. Yeah. So, um, and that's where a lot of, I mean, just especially when we're getting to like mythical creatures. I mean, these stories, it's, it's so weird how every culture has their own mythical creatures, but there's always these crossover things. And I don't know if, if that's based on something that they heard from other cultures or if these cultures are totally separated and they've never heard it, but it's just a natural, you know, that's what people come up with as far as why does, what makes this th this way like what makes the sun rise or what makes this and before you know before we started understanding science we had to come up with what we thought the reason was yeah and it's sure. funny how different cultures come up with that so um so i think that's part of story is is explaining things that we don't really understand maybe um at least the origins of these types of stories yeah yeah and it's it's i don't know to me it's it's a an interesting one because I myself don't really know fully like where the compulsion to just kind of tell these things comes from but it's like a really intense drive I think for most people who are like driven to kind of do create our own stuff and it's this very like fascinating thing of like just like you feel driven or compelled to kind of tell something and yet um, you know like I mean some of it's like you know life experience and stuff like that but like everybody has life experience you know everybody tells stories you know to friends and stuff like that but what compels somebody to like pick one and and really write about it and like craft it and then spend years doing it? um it's a weird it's an interesting thing um peter are you back no okay i, I guess peter's audio <coughs> if you're <coughs> if you're back peter your audio is still muted um so yeah, uh, I saw his video. It looked, but then now it's back to just his icon. So yeah, yeah, uh, oh. yeah. It's it, it's been jamming up or something. So yeah. I decided to take off the uh, other cam. Okay. Uh, no worries. Yeah. Uh, um. So like, with with you, um, y you're kind of like, where do you think the overall compel compulsion to your own stories comes from? Not not just for the hundreds. Um, which, as uh, Mike pointed out in the chats, is is the challenge where you, you spend at least 30 minutes a day working on your own uh, personal comic project. And then, uh, you know, and it's a personal challenge. You try to blog about it like once uh, every day, uh, documenting your 30 minutes, logging it so that you do it for at least 100 days straight. If you're doing it right, I think you're not really supposed to take any breaks whatsoever uh, for that 100 days. Um, some people make like an exception for like a Sunday or a Saturday, so they have one day. Um, and then you post about it so that you're held accountable. I, I don't explain it quite as well as a lot of others in the hundreds, but but that's the general gist. So um, when you're when you're not doing it for the hundreds, like what drives like what's driven you to kind of make your own stuff? Like um, 
and, and your own stories and stuff, Peter? Well, every everything comes from inspiration. Like, like you know, I mean, I'm working in comics before because I grew up reading comics, and you know, it's like I'm writing stories. Um, because I read comics, but also like I got into reading novels big, like probably uh, while I was in college. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's like, I, I always wanted to, I wanted to more so be, be a novelist before yeah, I wanted to work in comics, I think. And, and you know, like, seriously thinking about it like um when i first started reading comics it would be like oh yeah you know it's like i could draw a little and it would be cool to work in comics but uh i think i seriously thought about being a, a, a novelist first um and, and what what drives me to write stories um is that i i just have like my mind is always full of ideas and I just want to get them out there yeah. <laughs> to, to stay sane. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I just got a, a jumble of ideas and thoughts and, and like to, to be able to sit down and, and put those thoughts together and, and make a story out of it um, is so fulfilling. Yeah. Much, much like, you know, much like drawing and, and you know, inking for me, um, you know, telling stories is, is, it's just really invigorating. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like, I, I've done videos on my channel and, um, or I spoke about this, but, um, you know, there's a possible thing that's going to happen um, where, you know, I not too long ago, I wrote, like, somebody, um, a friend of mine approached me and said somebody was looking for a comic book writer. And um, I, I sent the uh, person an email, and they said, yeah, you know, can you write my the first issue of my comic? I have, a, you know, a general idea of of the story. So he actually sent me a videotape sort of going over the beats of what would be the first issue. <coughs> um, so it was like a general idea of the story. And what I did was write, it wasn't a full script. It was like somewhere in between Stanley writing a comic and, and Alan Moore writing a comic. Yeah. So <laughs> the two extremes, it was somewhere in the middle. Um, but I, I wrote the first issue, and he was like, "This is amazing! I, can you, you know, can you write a novel?" I was like, "Okay." <laughs> so um, we talked back and forth, and what came of it, and this is still like, you know, it's not a hundred percent happening, but I might be writing like a nine-book novel series. Nice. Oh, wow! Yeah, um, which is crazy and insane. But I thought, like, you know, based on sort of the general idea of the story and um, what he's involved in, and I'm not going to mention his name unless it actually happens, but um, I was like, I could pull this off. You know, it would be a lot of work, and it would be, like, years <laughs> to, to do the series, but... Um, you know, if I can get financed a long way and, and stuff. So we, we, we worked out a deal. We still have to sign the final contract, but um, it seems to be moving forward. That's awesome. Yeah. Are you going to miss, like, comics in that time, doing uh, doing prose if you end up doing that? The, the plan is um, because I'll, I'll be financed to do it, it will allow me actually to, to – uh, do what I have set forth to do, which is build my own sort of publishing company. Um, yeah, I figured if I put in four hours 
every morning to write on the novel and then the rest of the day would be my comic work i could do it you know it would take it would take me four to six months for each novel um and so it was like we're talking nine novels all together so it would be like five years worth of work wow, um, wow. But, but yeah it, it's it's really insane um but it's like I wouldn't do it if I didn't think I had the capability. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I, I thought about this. It's like I don't know if you sort of knew it's the Mission Impossible, but uh, in it there's like a reference to uh, like Tom Cruise, like um, okay, um, the guy who plays Superman. Uh, I forget his name, the actor. Anyway, he's he's in the movie, and he's sort of referred to as the hammer, and Tom Cruise is, is the uh, scalpel. <laughs> I'm more like the hammer as far as writing <laughs> goes. <laughs> um, but I, I think I can, you know, uh, as I do more and more writing, I can I can fine tune it. Yeah, yeah, and and what's interesting is like the the investment of that many years isn't all that unusual in comics, you know, <laughs> like, um, but what's neat is like with prose, like the, you know, there's a lot of things I love about comics, but the nice thing about writing prose is you're going to have a lot more pages <laughs> in five years than I think with comics, you know, cause comics, especially if you're writing and drawing them, it's like it's the slowest process on the, on the planet. Um, next to animation. I think animation would be the prize of the one, slower form of, of storytelling where you need like a, a team of a, a huge team, you know, to make it happen. That's yeah. cool though. I'm excited, man. I can't wait to see um, how that, how that kind of shakes out. Yeah. Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, the challenge, the challenge of it is that it is like, um, it is kind of somebody else's idea. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to have to like send them, a, a huge questionnaire, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, what is this character like? Do you, you know, like as far as his vision goes, yeah. I want to, I want to put that on paper and flesh, flesh the rest of it out. So that's, it's a bit of a challenge, but I think, I think once, once I get grooving, that's really exciting. Um, cool. So, um, oh, man, this is making me excited in the chats. It looks like there's, uh, like mighty Pegasus is is getting converted to um to jumping uh to jumping into the hundreds challenge. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. Cool. So uh, he's also saying um, he's asking if there's a difference when writing a novel compared to writing for a comic book. Oh heck yeah! yeah. <laughs> <laughs> heck yeah! I, you know I mean to to date um, I have not finished writing a novel. Uh, you know, although I, I attempted it a couple of times, um, and you're gonna do, and you, you're 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 poised to do uh, how many book series? <laughs> it's <laughs> nine books all wow, together. That, well, that would scare the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't envy you, but um, but yeah, you know, it's like it's it's definitely different because you know you got artwork in the mix in the comic and you can really write almost uh minimal and let all the artwork tell the story um you know uh is it there's different way different kinds of approaches but um it and it can be more a lot more collaborative with the artist with with writing prose and novel you're pretty much on your own. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you got you got like editors or publishers or whoever's involved to assist in in you know like once you got a first draft to to really beef that up and and sharpen the story and all that. But uh, you know, you're mo you're mostly uh, on your own in the beginning. Yeah, and. Um... I mean, I like one of the things that comes to mind for me is <clears throat> if you're just writing, you can kind of 
describe a scene with like a lot of vivid detail and use a lot of adjectives and and verbs and stuff. But with um, when you're working on, it, I'm hearing slapback now. I'm making sure. Okay, I think. Um, so is anyone else hearing slapback? Uh, yeah, I'm hearing it. Yeah, I don't. I don't hear it. Uh, hmm. Um. All right. Well, I'll try to kind of keep going with that. Um. So, uh, the thing that's difficult with um, with with writing for comics, like one of the challenges is you really want to be showing more than telling. Whereas in a story, you're you're pretty much telling everything. <laughs> and so, um, like when you when you're just writing a, a prose story, it's, it's it's a little bit more of a challenge because the onus is on you as the writer to kind of do all the work. Whereas if you're um, writing for comics. Um, and then illustrating the comics, you're, you're generally wanting to let all the illustrations do most of the work. And then the words are kind of like guiding people along. Um, I don't know if that, that would, would you agree with that, Scott, on the differences? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so Peter, let's get a little bit into like um, inking, like some of your favorite approaches to inking um, and so on, how you're going to approach this. And maybe before even getting into that, just, uh, I mean, you know, I, I'm sure this is ground well covered, but still wouldn't hurt to kind of give people a little um, window into the kind of stuff you have inked in the past and, and currently ink. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, currently it's it's a lot of things in, in development. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, you know what? What mostly I'm known for is back in the '90s. I was working on Aquaman uh, when Peter David was writing it. And Jim, Jim Calfiore was the artist. Um, that was when Aquaman was uh, rough and tumble, and he had a, a hook as a, as a hand, <laughs> a beard, and long hair. Um, it's actually a lot of what. It, you know, influenced in in the new movie. Yeah. You know, was because of that run. Um, and you know, it's like I work for DC. I work for Marvel. I work for a number of independent uh, publishers. Uh, had a few books through Image. Um, you know, now I'm I'm like sort of pulling together um, my own creations. Uh, working on retro currently, uh, blood rights with with the team, um, and I, I'm sort of dabbling. I got I got bright eyes and neon Eden, which were previously web comics. I'm going to be bringing them back. Um, and yeah, it's like I got a lot of things going on. I'm working on. A short story for Detective Dead versus Bigfoot Bill. Uh, Detective Dead it was created by uh, this guy Critias, and uh, Bigfoot Bill is Doug to uh, mm. So it's a short story with the, both of those characters in it that I'm inking. Uh, I forget the artist's name. He's Filipino. Um, but yeah, it's like you know, it's like most mostly just. Um, a lot of random stuff um, that I've like collected over the years that I, I decided, you know, it's time to get this stuff inked. So, um, uh, yeah, just uh, I, I'm keeping way busy, um, you know, along the lines of like, you know, Scott going through challenges. I, I've just been hounded by technical problems since around September. <laughs> <laughs> when I tried to do uh, uh, 100, another round of 100 Days of Making Comics, uh -huh. um, I had my PC breakdown, various laptops breakdown. I had uh, internet issues, and I'm still plagued by a lot of that. Um, yeah. But uh, with not only the, the novel project coming up, uh, I'm probably going to be doing a graphic novels for another publisher. Um, I'm going to have a lot more 
money coming in and it's just going to cover <laughs> everything because yeah. I'm, I'm buying all new stuff uh, i'm moving out of here i'm you know it's like part of part of my internet problem is my location got um, it which, which you think, wouldn't think would be an issue but somehow i'm in the worst spot possible <laughs> No, I, that makes perfect sense because, um, like where I live, like there's one service provider for the internet and they're terrible. Um, yeah. and I'll say it, you know, <laughs> <Warner>. <laughs> um, but it's like, I, I wish they didn't have a monopoly in the area. Um, cause when my wife and I lived in long beach, like we used to have, um, uh, um, Verizon Fios and right. it was so fast and effective. And then like, moving here it's like that's one of the downsides is just like there's no option to fios because they don't service this area and like time warner is pretty much the only provider in the area which really <laughs> you know kind of sucks because it, it cuts out all the time um uh oh this is interesting mike in the chats was saying alan moore essentially writes every last detail down to the panel Whereas Scott Snyder basically writes dialogue and the breast reads like he's telling a buddy about a movie he saw. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually pretty accurate from the stuff I've read too. Yeah. Um, man, anyhow, that's, that's hilarious. Um, but Mike then follows up by saying, uh, that's what makes comics great to me. There is no right way to make them. And I agree with that. Like the, the great thing about this playground of comics is like, it's still like such a weird industry where you know like i think the hundreds is a really good example of that like the the hundreds anthology number two is like a nice little mix you know between um like really seasoned pros and like people who like this might be their first comic and the only entry point is and, and connection really between everybody is that they successfully completed the uh the hundred days and to me that's such a cool entry point for um you know for the for this anthology it's pretty rare even for comics but the neat thing about comics is that's one of those things that kind of happens only in comics or at least i don't see happen in other things like um yeah so okay so you so you've done a lot of inking and do you want to kind of get into and maybe we can go around and scott can share a little bit too but some of the tricks you've learned in inking and the method you like to use now um as opposed sure. to like maybe how you started um you know it, it's to me for me it's it's much the same way um you know i've learned how to ink better over the years but i haven't really stretched uh, beyond what i initially did <laughs> meaning like you know i started with a brush and i started with a quill and that's pretty much what I use now. Um, there might have been little little techniques and tricks, um, like, but I don't I don't use a lot of them. I mean, you know, to me, it's it's all about lines. Um, you know, there's stuff like splatter, which I I do once in a blue moon. Um, this, you know, I use like a, a Exacto blade to uh, scratch out lines um, sometimes, like that's good for rain or, or, or just uh, explosion or effects sometimes. Um, but uh, yeah, it's like, you know, um, ink wise, I probably started with uh, Higgins Black Magic and that's pretty much what I'm using today. Um, but I, I learned along the way, there's another ink called Pelican um, that I love. Uh, I used other inks, but uh, those are my two favorites. Um, mm -hmm. a, a technique I use, um, like if, if I'm using a brush, I tend to want the ink um, to be as, as thick as possible. So I might leave a bottle of ink open uh, for hours or a day sometimes um, so that the, the ink just gets thicker. Sometimes like Higgins tends to be a little watery. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want it to get thicker. Um, if I'm using Quill, it's just the opposite. I want to 
add a little water to it so it doesn't it doesn't all clog up on the tip of the quill so how's so i'm curious because i don't i i could never master the quill so yeah. what how do you choose what to i mean is the brush your primary tool or do you prefer a quill and what's kind of separates the two what what makes you decide what to do with the quill and what to do with the brush well since i i i only use a one on two point which is uh thin um it's really like it's really best for detail you know sometimes i use it for some thick lines but um it's most it's mostly for smaller detail okay. but you do primarily use you do use the quill instead of the brush so the brush is more for spotting blacks and things like that correct and, yeah okay um uh i use a combination i mean it depends on my flow um you know and it depends on on the artist i'm working on uh like with cow fury uh especially on aquaman there was a ton of underwater ocean scenery and and atlantis and just mobs of people and quill is perfect for all that intricate detail and keep it sharp and all that um but there's other artists where it's just ridiculous to use a quill because it's all big, bold, and thick lines, and right. you know, lots of black and whatnot. Um, yeah, because I mean, I, I, you, my lines are pretty fine. I mean, I don't use a lot of blacks, but I still use a brush just because I could never master the quill. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Well, what it came down to was, uh, I mean, you know, it's like I was using at the very beginning. I was using. Um, only brush and uh you know my brother who used to be an anchor an anchor he's just a writer now um he he told me you know i should i should use the quill you know um and i really had to force myself to to learn it yeah um i mean it it was painful learning um because you just you just tear into paper and nothing comes out right and yeah really it really took me a while but then then again you know it took me a while to master just the regular brush yeah how do you get over the um because i know like on a brush there's kind of a sweet spot where you can get especially with like feathering you know there's like it, you kind of do your test lines you find that like sweet spot and you you kind of learn to like hold it at that sweet spot when you're doing it at the right angle but with quill the thing that always threw me off is like occasionally you know i'd want to treat it like a micron or something and <laughs> i'll move my line like to the side and it'll split the the um i don't even know what the word for that tines. is yeah the tines on the nib and then similarly like um or i'll i'd, I'd accidentally go backwards and then the tine would just like spit ink <laughs> you know yeah. <laughs> and it's like it, to me that's the most annoying thing and i'm not sure if it's maybe i was just using the wrong nib um or if it was just like a that's just something you kind of get around by like angling your paper like I, do you have any tips on that like that kind of <laughs> the oh. thing I'm describing other than just practice <laughs> um you know what it is it's like i'm um, i guess in a sense i try not to be conscious of what I'm doing to a certain extent, yeah, because, because it's all it's all muscle memory that you've built up over the years. Yeah, no, that makes uh, sense. Um, you know, the minute <laughs> it's like I re I remember at some point in my life I I was like how how am I breathing? Yeah, you know, and the minute that thought entered my mind is like now I'm having trouble breathing. Yeah, <laughs> so it's like. Um, I try not to think about it, but, uh, what I, what I have learned is that, you know, it's like, if you're using a brush, you don't want to, you don't want to just push it all the way to the paper. Cause then you, you ruin the brush. Of course. Yeah. You're you floating. Know? Yeah. So, so it's a certain amount of pressure works with the quill. You know, you, you don't want to push too hard. Or, you know, it's like the best, the best angle is that it's laying on the paper. It's not pointed at the paper. 
Ah, uh, see, that's my issue. Because like when you when you when I draw with a pen, you know, it's it's generally kind of like pretty straight down, you know. So yeah, that's it's not fascinating. It's not that. Yeah, it's you you're laying it, and if you apply too much pressure, then you're going to pick up paper threads, and that's bad. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's also a matter of keeping the tip clean. Um. It's like I don't put too much ink on the quill, you know. I dip, I dip it constantly. Yeah. So, so there's not too much. Um, if you overflow it, it's just going to burp all out on your paper. Um, but if you know, if you don't keep it clean, which is I, I use a you know exacto blade to keep the point uh, clean of, of just hot ink. Um, that's, that's one way. Another way is like some people uses, use rags, um, or even dip it into a bottle of water. Uh, but I, I, for me, exact the blade is, is my favorite way of keep just keeping it clean, keeping it sharp. <laughs> huh. That's fascinating, man. That I don't know about you, Scott, but anytime I hear about Quill, I just get filled with envy. <laughs> yeah, you know, I now. I mean, now I'm kind of moving in more to digital, not inking. I don't, but but sometimes I wonder if I should, if I was maybe just too young and didn't didn't give it a good enough shot. If I should, if I could go back and play around with the Quill, but you know, I don't know. <clears throat> well, you know, one one day we'll, I promise, we'll do a hangout and. Like, we could do a side by side. I'll, I'll teach oh, you. Oh, that'd be it. cool. Yeah, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be, that'd be cool. Yeah, because like the the quill is so fascinating, and it does seem like there's a um, there's like a language to whatever tool you use, and pretty much most of what I use now is primarily brush, and then this weird kind of um, noodly style that I'm working on right now on the sketch is like is is usually done with like a lot of microns and. and as well as um, <coughs> brush, <coughs> excuse me, but um, but it's like it, it it would be nice to have like another you know um, kit in the toolbox. And I have a similar thing because I do kind of wonder because most of my playing around with quill was like in art school, you know, where I think I was still at the time like really fond of using sharpies and stuff too. Um, not not di dissing sharpies. There's artists who come up with brilliant stuff with sharpies, but oh yeah. But, for me, it was like, um, it took me a long time to just kind of go, oh, like I could do that with a brush much more effectively and quicker, you know, <laughs> like, um, but like it, it took the hard way of like trying everything but brush to switch to brush. So I'd wonder if it's a similar thing with Quill where like the second, um, yeah, that's really cool. Um, so are, are there methods, like are there tactics to like inking you haven't tried that you really want to try? Like artists out there maybe that you see that um where you're just like man you know like I, i'd like to try that out you know um well cory kerr is doing a, i've seen his pages for the anthology and he's trying a lot of different techniques um you know it's like sometimes but mostly i i just want to perfect my line work you know, and that's, yeah. that's just, just, you know, it's like, um, it, if you were to ask me what you're inking like, you know, like describe what it looks like, I, I would say it's just a bunch of lines, <laughs> you know, it's like, there's nothing, there's nothing fancy about it. It's just a bunch of lines put together and that, that's how I ink. Um, you know, you get somebody like uh, Bill Sienkiewicz, for those that know him, who goes, you know, he uses every technique in the book eventually, you know. And, and yeah, it's like I want to throw stuff in. Some stuff shouts out to be uh, presented in a certain way. Like, like definitely, like, with Rain, um, to do it, sort of in a sense traditionally uh just using lines takes forever 
So you want to <laughs> you want to find some shortcuts sometimes. You know, you you could just ink a page naturally and then get a bottle of white ink and throw down some white lines and it saves you you know about a day's worth of work <laughs> instead of trying to just go around things and and leave leave the raindrops um because that's that's how like freaking i remember the first time i i did like uh, um space with stars i would go in with a rapidograph and, and circle each star and then fill in the black around them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember that, yeah. It, it <laughs> took me it took me hours and hours to do it that way, but oh, yeah. I, I'm so anal and like ridiculous sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I relate to that. I think um even the last graphic novel I was working on, I did that with stars and then was just kind of weirded out that I didn't just get a toothbrush and splatter it, like, <laughs> like, you know. I do, I do that like with Kirby Crackle and stuff like that, where I'll kind of go around it. Like they're bigger than stars, so it's not that tedious. But yeah, but it would probably be so much easier just go in with white and just boom, boom, boom. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Mike in the chat said, "Wait, that's not how you ink space." <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's it's a way. I think I think the. I think the weird thing, and and um, Scott, I want to hear your kind of take on it too, because um, you're really good with a brush. Um, but like for me, what I've found ever since kind of picking up brush is that um, they're, they're it, it's kind of what you're describing, where it's like you start out doing things kind of the hard way, and then you find the shortcut, and you're like, why wasn't I doing this like the whole time? Um, and I it, that even goes down to like. Like I was in love with feathering because Charles Burns was like one of my favorite artists and I just loved his feathering. He has like some of the cleanest feathering around and um, and really well designed, you know, just areas of just flat black feathering. Um, and and so I would look at that and as a young artist, I, I, I didn't know anyone who used brush. Um, and so I just assumed that it had like somebody had drawn it around those those uh those feathered lines and so i i actually did the outline of the feather um well with like a micron and then filled it with black like that's how i thought that was done initially right. <laughs> and i remember the first time i discovered oh it's a brush and you pull it this way it was like this light bulb moment and i feel like my my time inking now is like is very similar where I'm constantly filled with like little light bulb moments. Although there's times where I'm still super surprised too um, by new things. Like Corey was talking about using thumbprints, and I was like, "Oh, dude! I, I, I mean, I've like, I've um, smeared and done smudging, but I'd never thought of just using the thumbprint itself as like a texture." I was like, "That's kind of a cool trick." <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> I, I want to mess with that now. <laughs> Yeah, you get you got to be careful with that because then somebody will use, eventually use your fingerprints on something. Yeah, that's, a, that's a fair <laughs> point. Yeah, I mean, this is the internet, so yeah. you might just scan your page and steal your identity. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, Scott, like, what what about you? Like, so when when you've been inking, um, like, uh, like, kind of what what things have you wanted to try? I mean, we just mentioned the quill. That you may not have tried yet. Um, oh like, well, you know, like things you want to dip into. Yeah, so I mean that that really is going to hopefully happen when I start inking my 100s uh, story for the anthology because I really want to try some of these techniques that I haven't done before. Um, and it's funny because you know Peter brought up Corey, and you know Corey's got that advantage of having just awesome inked original artwork that he's purchased hanging up on his wall that he can look at and study and stuff and it it just opens up a new world when you can see that because i remember when i first when i first saw original art was there was this gallery that opened in scottsdale um 
and they it was like a comic book art gallery so i got to see like real pages and got to see all the paste ups and everything like that and once you when you see that it's like oh man i can i can see how they did that oh that they, they made a mistake there and they pasted over it or 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 they you know they whited that out or whatever and then some of the stuff was like super old where the type was actually pasted in and stuff so i mean that really helps to see that stuff but i mean i was just i actually i actually paused Corey's video when he was showing that stuff off and i'm trying to like, look and see how they did it um so yeah i want to try some of that stuff i want to i want to try some like splatter effects and um uh, definitely get do some more uh with white ink and, and everything and yeah um, a lot more blacks for at least the portion of the the the, the creature portion of the story um because I'm used to, uh, I'm used to, you know, most of my stuff is just very uh, straight, like line art, and I don't yeah. spot a lot of blacks and things. But I want to, you know, try some of that stuff. So, yeah, I'm, you know, I want to, you know, I did a, I did a, I did a what was, oh no, like, because I did a, I did an inking uh, art hack video. And in doing that, I experimented with experimented a little bit with some of these different techniques that I, you know, knew about, but I haven't really put them into practice. So, yeah. Um, but I'd like to actually, you know, put them into practice on an actual project as opposed to just a, you know, a YouTube video. So yeah, yeah I'm really looking forward to all that stuff. But if you're if you're curious about some different inking techniques, I I've got I don't know how far back it is, but it's there's a you know it's back in October. So if you scroll back, because it was when October came out, I did a I did a whole art hack video on inking tricks and stuff. So there's a lot of stuff there that you can glean from. Yeah, I I, I it's it's an interesting thing, and I think um I think all th all three of us share like a total love for inking and oh uh, just yeah um like different. For, for this comic, for me, like I, I would say, like this comic quarterly stories is a big kind of experiment for me at first because um, up until then, any like hatch work or anything I would do with like um, a technical pen, and this was the first time where, with a fairly thick brush, I realized that I had the I had I had from doing freelance for like over ten years, like where like the majority of the time it was all traditionally inked um i had like picked i i kind of had what happened what peter was describing happen where you just kind of notice one day like oh this isn't like as much work as it used to be like to the point where i i would ink stuff traditionally because it would take less time than digital you know and and but but i had this light bulb moment of going like oh i can do all that hatching like those fine hatching lines with um with a uh, brush and just just like by hovering it like really high up with enough control it's like you can do these fine little lines with like a really thick brush and um that to me really just opened up a door um that like but i do have to say i kind of want to get um like i think if i do a project after this i might want to do a little more washes and and kind of mess with like the really messy ink you know <laughs> like yeah really sloppy stuff because it it um there is something really liberating about that like just rubbing parts and stuff like that because my in general like my my inking is pretty controlled and um even even peter what you were describing of just like pulling out a um like like scratching it you know a page to make um to make like rain lines that's right. a cool trick but that yeah. would scare the crap out of me, <laughs> like, because I'm such a kind of, I am kind of the guy who, like, I want to ink everything. I want to ink my lettering. I want to ink everything. Right, okay. But I, but I, but I like the control of it. So there's something really f frightening um, about losing control with stuff, which is funny because I think generally my natural inclination with style is to go really rough. So I, I find that, um, like, whenever I see really like uh, a good example would be like mike um did these and and we've probably all seen them these little studies for his book the goblins book that right. uh, the short that he's going to do for the anthology and they were so beautiful and they were they were really loose yeah. and and kind of blobby but like really accurate and to me when i see stuff like that um that's definitely an area that i want to kind of toy with because it's it, it it looks kind of liberating and also frightening at the same time. <laughs> and I think Peter, I think you've been inking long enough to kind of have that balance probably where there's a lot of play, but there's also a lot of control, you know? 
Yeah, it's like I, I can definitely I know where to play and where to control. Um but it's 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 like, you know, when I was young, I I was you know, I was an artist. I can draw, I was drawing. Um went to art school later. Um but when it when I decided upon working in comics as, as a career, specifically as an anchor, um, it was a whole different thought pattern. Yeah. And now, um, as I become more of an artist now, uh, I'm sort of battling my former self for, for control in a sense. <laughs> um, so it, it's like, I want to. I want to lose myself in the art, um, so I'm not so much, you know, like every line's got to be perfect. It's like I want to see where the line takes me. Yeah. So I'm not so worried about um, being on point with with anatomy or whatever. You know, it's like it's more like in the end, you know. I guess like that's that's the anchor taking control. It's like I just want it pretty in the end. It yeah. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's <laughs> you know a little goofy uh, perspective wise or, or anatomy wise or whatever. Yeah, and um, I mean I, I think that's to me that resonates a lot because um, even in doing this story, when I was picking, I knew I wanted to do it in like two alternate styles, but when I was picking the other style, um, it was for stories that all like revolved around like when I was a really little kid. And so I decided to do this kind of like weird, um, uh, Mary Blair, if she were on acid kind of style <laughs> and, um, um, and kind of throw a lot of like anatomy and stuff out the window. Um, and, and 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 it's been really fun and and kind of interesting because it's more about like shape and composition and stuff. And I think um, Scott, I mean, I think like you were you were talking about kind of simplifying. I mean, obviously, I don't think you're simplifying to the level I'm I'm sketching in right now. But um, but like, but you know, um, when you were doing Young and the Dead, you you were talking about like before having kind of issues where you were too kind of perfect perfectionistic. Mm -hmm. um, with your approach and you kind of had to come up with a more simplified fashion so you could actually get some pages done. Yeah. And, if um, you, yeah. If you look at my earlier work, like um, I pretty much skip cause I would do blue lines and then I take, you know, the regular graphite pencil and I go over and tighten everything up. So everything was basically the way it would be if you were to hang it, hand it off to an anchor. So the anchor, if they, they could just follow that line exactly. Yeah, and I pretty much trashed that whole graphite portion of it. So everything, so most of, uh, you know, when I ink my own stuff right now, and I might change that for this book here. I mean, this this four page story, but it's basically the it's it's a lot of guesswork, like because the pencils are super loose and super rough that the tightening stage comes with the inking so i mean there might be a line or a few just sketchy lines i'm like well which what which of these lines am i going to follow and and that type of thing so um very different from my earlier stuff where you know any kind of cr i say cross hatching loosely because i've never been good at cross hatching so i just don't do it especially any time that that they they actually the lines actually cross is yeah. cross hatching like if you look at if you look at like uh like Kevin Cross's work, um, he, he he. I don't know if he necessarily does like cross hatching because his lines don't usually cross like that. Yeah, uh, I, you know, and there's no pun intended there. But but <laughs> but but his his are when he does his hatching, it's more to kind of fade to almost give that illusion. And I guess that's what most cross hatching is, but give that illusion of of when you're dealing with all blacks of, of things sort of fading away, but the, I, I really love the way he does it. So yeah. I would try to maybe try to, that's about as far as I would go, but anytime I, lines like actually cross, I cannot get them to look right. It just looks bad to me. And I <laughs> see people like, you know, pe people like Art Adams who does tons of that stuff. And I don't know how he yeah. does it because it looks great, but it's like, if I tried to do that, I'm like, whoa, that's not good at all. So I don't, <laughs> I stay away from that. But, 
but anyway, but but I do I I I will do sort of like you know a little straight lines out to show that it's kind of something's kind of sort of you know fading away a little bit. Yeah. Um, but that was all real dark pencils, and then of course you can just go over that with an ink. And there's like for that was there's no guesswork. So the good thing is when I when I did that kind of prep work for that when I went over ink there you know I, I wasn't so worrisome. So so that was even more. You know, kind of that therapeutic uh, mindset you get in, where you're just basically just going over the lines there, and it's you don't yeah. think too much. But now I have to think a little more because it's like I got to pick the lines out of the really rough sketches and stuff. But yeah. that's one thing that I did to kind of speed up my process. Yeah, it's funny. I I kind of went the reverse where I think when I was starting out, I was a lot looser um, before inking, and then I found that I spent so much time having a lot of um, and, and this, once again, this might be kind of like our quill conversation where it's like, you know, when you're young, like, um, you know, like you might try quill and be like, oh, I'm never going to try quill. And then maybe it was just being young. This might be a similar scenario, but I just found that I'd be spending so much guesswork and, and time just like trying to figure out where to commit when inking that it made inking this really laborious process. So now I like really, um, especially on the more, you know, like, um, render, uh, parts of this, uh, of, of quarterly stories, like, or like, um, in the case of the, uh, the dinosaur comic that I'm doing for, um, the hundreds anthology, it's like, I'm, I'm making sure my, my pencils are pretty much tight to where when I'm inking, it's just occasionally I'll, I'll have the freedom to make a, lo a little bit of change, but in general, I have such a clear map that it's like, it, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. So it's just kind of like therapy inking at that point, you know? Um, mm. But uh, it's a weird thing. Cause I feel like if you, if I gave it to an inker, um, it, it might be less fun to work on. Cause then it's just literally like going over, you know what I mean? There's less, less freedom to kind of make a choice. I don't know what your, what your thoughts on that are. Um, as an anchor, uh, I like, all ends of the spectrum. I, I prefer a little loose, um, but not too loose, yeah. you know? Um, but, you know, I, I've worked on Cal Fury and Cal Fury is pretty much the tightest artist out there um, to where the only difference a lot of the times was pure line weight, you know? Yeah. Um, so this, what, what, um, uh, Scott was saying before, like this cross hatching, which is two lines inter intersecting, and single line is is what I consider feathering. Just okay, you know. yeah, that yeah, that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. So definitely, that. I would say what Kevin Cross does is more feathering. What Josh does is more cross hatching. Yeah, yeah. it depends. It, you know, it's um, th th there's a trick too that I learned with cross hatching because I didn't do it right at first. Um, I had this idea of um, cross hatching being like a literal like 90 degree, which is which is a big bad thing in cross hatching apparently. <laughs> um, you can do that for like texture, but um, but that was like that um, when I was a student, like that was one of my biggest weaknesses was my cross hatching would would um, like I'd be trying to depict shade but the angle that I was applying the second phase of lines, you know, um, right. was at a 90. And so it would always look like a grid. Um, <laughs> and so I remember I had this teacher who, who very rightly gave me a hard time for a long time. And I was like a young cocky artist. So I'm like, whatever, I'm great at cross hatching. And then finally, um, <laughs> One day they they just kind of yelled at me and was like, "It's a forty-five, not a ninety. A forty-five. If you do a forty-five, this will look beautiful. At a ninety, it looks like crap." And I was like, "Whatever." And then I went home and tried it and was like, "Oh, this looks a million times better." <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah. So that's a good tip. Like if if you're new to like cross hatching and stuff, if you're not trying to show texture and you're just trying to show a value shift. Um, do it at a 45 and then from there do it at a 45 and just alternate 45s all over the place and you'll find that um, 
those angles really make the illusion of shade much more clearly. And if you look at like Durer stuff, like Albert Durer's um, wood wood cuts and stuff, you'll see like where he, where he's you know where he's showing texture. He might use a ninety, but most of the time it's like a perfect forty five degree angle. Which Peter, you're incredible at at, <laughs> at getting um, a lot of hatch work um, as well. So it's like, I don't know. Like to me, that's really um, mystifying. It's it's cool to me that there's that there's this broad range. You know, like you can go that you can go R crumb, um, you can go to you know like like Scott was mentioning like the, the Kevin Cross style where it's like more of like a, a Walt uh, Kelly like really thick to thin line and playing with that line weight. And I'd say, Scott, you're brilliant at that too. Like having like a really clear thick to thin. Um, I, yeah, I, that's something I'm still kind of working on. <laughs> As an artist, like the hardest thing I, I find to do is like how, how Scott draws, like keeping it so clean and, and, and crisp, like, as an inker, I could do that, but uh, as an artist, it's like, I, you know, it's like I'm just all over the place. Um, this was what I was working on, um, just beefing up the sketch. I was. <laughs> nice. so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in with inks over that. Um, oh, you me you mentioned um, wash. I have done some wash, um, not on comic pages, just like on the illustrations and whatnot. Um, that is something I would like to get more into, uh, but I would also like to find a, a big, giant, thick brush that would work well with wash. Yeah. Um, because I, I tend to, you know, it's like I don't have too thick of a brush, and yeah. in wash, you really need to cover a lot of territory and um, to do it the way I want to do it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it washes, washes a lot of fun. I mean, I get that from, you know, I've done a little bit of watercolor in my time. Yeah. I want to get back more into watercolor. And, um, but as, you know, um, Scott mentioned before, like, uh, looking at Corey's vi video because he had original artwork. Um, you know, it's like, if you go to conventions, there's always, an, uh, usually a lot of them have um, kind of like art dealers where they have pages displayed where you can go in and just look at them there. Yeah. Um, but I remember back in the day, like my brother is, a, you know, not only working in comics, but he, he's collected a lot of art over the years and always has pages and covers hanging on his wall. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember back in the day um, when Joe Casada was doing a lot of uh, Batman work. Um, it was a bunch of the covers he did that were inked by Kevin Nolan, um, and he had them hanging up in his apartment. And I used to cat sit for him back in the day, and um, I used to stare at those those covers for just hours. Yeah, just like you know, it's like not not mentally remembering anything but just like storing information through my eyeballs yeah <laughs> and that's that's how i learned i mean i've looked at so many c comics where i would just stare at amazing artwork um and and somehow retain some of it <laughs> yeah no that makes perfect sense um and and the, like touching on what you were saying scott too about that like with the um the way you're, you're right because like when you do see those pages in person it's like a, as a creator yourself it's like you, you almost can't help but start to reverse engineer it yeah you know because you can actually see like the angle the brush took and you can see like oh okay they, they put like pro white here and they they use this like tool here and oh is, did they scrape something there like what what was that you know and like start kind of figuring it out from there um like e even the way i'm approaching my comic a lot of that has to do with i've mentioned this before but when i went to like the masters of american comics um and i, and I was doing comics I, I saw all these beautiful pages like in person like some some original jack kirby pages like um walt kelly um uh let's see like I, pretty much everyone under the sun including our crumb 
And our crumb was one of those ones where my brain was just kind of exploded a little bit because he's so clean and it, it doesn't, it doesn't translate like how clean his art is in, until you see it in person, like his inks, um, especially on his stuff when he was younger, it, it was like, it, it's not sloppy and loose. It's like really methodical and, and clean. And, and it, it was a real surprise to me, but it also helped me kind of decide, okay, I, I, I do think with him he uses a lot of quill, but for me that did help me like commit to to doing a brush. I really I really want to delve into quill though. Like you, you yeah, we'll, got we'll my do. interest peaked again. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll we'll definitely do a hangout when I get better equipment and shit. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's like I remember seeing uh, like before Frank Vizetta set up uh, his his gallery in, in uh, wherever it is located, uh, they had a showing in New York. Uh, so he had a lot of paintings, but they also had a lot of comic book pages where it was just his brushwork. Yeah. And, and seeing seeing that stuff in the, in the flesh, in a sense, um, is just amazing. Amazing. Um, and, and yeah, it's like uh, in New York, um, there's also uh, Mocha, which is a lot of uh, they have a lot of uh, artwork by some of uh, you know comic book greats, newspaper greats, and whatnot, just hanging on on their walls and whatnot. Oh, awesome! Uh, and, and yeah, it's it, nothing inspires me like seeing original artwork. Um, and, and you know, it's like for all the the videos I watch on YouTube of artists and whatnot, there's nothing like seeing it in person. Um, it's, it's not only the mistakes, it's in seeing the, the quality lines without yeah. breaks. It's, it's, you know, it's just the, the sheer texture of it. Um, you know, that maybe the paper they use, maybe the, uh, you know, just, just things you you don't see on the printed page. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, uh, like uh, Spiegelman had stuff at that show too, and it was like original pages of Mouse. And what I didn't realize is when he did that, he did it to scale. So like the the comics drawn at eight and a half by eleven, and then like that guy is sloppy as hell. Like when he works, it's just like there's paste up and just like photocopying and like anything that worked um, and you see like smudge lines. Cause I think it was using like a glue stick. It's, it's nuts, but it's like, in, that's one of those cases where the, the reprint looks all clean and, and a little loose, but it's like, you see this kind of mad method when you see the actual pages and it, it kind of gives you a little insight into the artist, you know, in their approach. Yeah. Um, so that's another route. I kind of, weirdly enough like that's another one of those ones that um that i'd like to kind of toy around with a little bit is um uh so you you guys have read like cages right or like seen dave mckeon's inks right um like that guy has this like loose kind of french line when he inks and it's and it's so like to me that's one of those ones that makes me want to pick up a quill because it's like the kind of line you can only do with quill and it, and it looks so pretty, you know, it's almost like the ink blob drawings that like Warhol did back in the day. Right. Like that, that, um, that's something that seems like, you know, it's, it's funny. Like a lot of the times I'll see styles that I don't work in and be like, that looks really fun. That's gotta be more fun than what I'm doing. And then, um, I'll be sadly disappointed when I find out it's work too. <laughs> I don't know. Well well, so, some things come natural. I mean, you don't know until you try. I mean, you know, it's like I, I, because I'm p becoming more of an artist, uh, I am exploring things more. It's like, um, you know, I, it's like I, I think about style a lot and, and how I want what I do to be sort of a concrete style you know it's like i'll never be uh john Byrne, george perez kind of style where they're, they're freaking consistent from birth to 
to death. I, I don't know, but um, uh, you know, it's like I I know. Out, out of all my penciling throughout the years, I, I noticed something like I'm being led to. And um, so take, taking some time here and there and exploring, like I was thinking of doing a, a series of videos on YouTube, like where it would be like copying the masters and, and like we do two or three p pieces copying Da Vinci or copying, you know, um, and see if you could adapt some of that into your work. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, that's, that's, um, that's something I always recommend, especially when people are, um, getting into like, cause most of my background was illustration with, with my education. Cause I didn't have access to like a cartooning program or any cartoonist I knew, you know, who could kind of show me the ropes. Um, but like, that's one thing I got in the program that I went to that I really like miss is like the, the consistent life drawing, um, which, which you kind of hate when you're a young artist and then just something snaps, um, at some point to where it's like the most fun thing on the planet. Like now to me, if I think of any kind of drawing that's like not work, it's life drawing. It just sounds fun, you know? Um, yeah. but, but. But it's like doing that a lot and then doing a lot of those those master copies, which once again, as a student, you're just like, oh, really? Come on, I want to draw something of my own. But in retrospect, it's like, oh, well, I, you know, you also learn, like even that thing I was talking about with hatching, Da Vinci used like hatching like crazy in his um in his sketchbooks. And and it's beautiful line and uh, actually pretty loose kind of kind of splattery stuff too. I, I love that stuff, man. That would be fun to kind of um, mimic or like just take like a Durr woodcut and try to redraw it, you know, <laughs> like um, I think that's good practice, you know. Um, and that's how like, I think that's how most of us kind of came up too. It's like I, I think most of us when we were kids, I, I, like, you know, did you guys copy comics when you were kids? Like, like, like comic covers, like redraw them, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, w I would cover copy like scenes out of a comic. Uh, when, when I became serious of becoming an anchor, I definitely copied full figures and, and tried to mimic the anchor. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I think that's the only way to kind of like, that's kind of similar to like reverse engineering a page from looking at it. It's like the, the way to figure it out is like try to mimic it. And then you're like, well, that, that angle didn't work. Let me try this angle, <laughs> you know? Um, I don't know, Scott, I'm curious, like, so have you always had, um, well, obviously I, you were talking about it adapting, but like that clean line style, how did you arrive at that? And then how long did it take you to get that kind of control over like a really long line where it can go thin to thick, you know? Um, I basically, I started when I, when I first started teaching myself how to ink what I would do because you know they, it wasn't it wasn't like the internet where you could go and like find pencil pages and and just print those out and ink over them so there wasn't really access to to pencil pages so everything that I found you know or what I what I did was I just took comic books um, and I just brought them to a Xerox copy turned down the the, the you know the tone as much as I could to get rid of as much of the color as I could um, and blew them up to what they would, would have been drawn at at 11 by 17, bring those back home. And then, cause I'm, you know, didn't have a printer that did that go to the copy place and everything. And then I would just take a, a sheet of vellum and put it over it. And then I would just practicing practice inking over say like a Jim Lee X-Men or something like that. Um, and I just kept doing that until I kind of got the hang of it and, and I would look and so I was actually I wasn't following the pencils I was following the ink so in some ways maybe that helped because I could kind of see where the lines tapered off where they got thicker and started to learn about how where the sun hits affects where your line should be and everything like that yeah um, and, and yeah it's, it's, that's I just kept doing that until eventually I got that and like I said I tried with the quill and it just wasn't working and then I switched over a brush and eventually I kind of, I got a, I got a feel for the brush. Yeah. 
That's awesome. Um, and actually, you touched on something that I think since we're talking inking, um, Peter, you want you want to talk about that? Like when, like at what times? Because um, I, th you know, Scott kind of kind of started it, but I, th I think so. At what times do you choose to kind of make your line? Uh, where choose where your line weight's going to go, like the thickest part versus the thinnest part. Oh, real quick, before you get into that, I just want to correct yeah. myself and say those were Scott Williams inks that I was going over because of Scott Williams inking Jim Lee. So, sorry, go ahead. Right. <laughs> nice. Credit where credit's due. <laughs> um, where, where, where do I put? Um, well, the, the, the basic approach, and uh, I always mention this, is like, you know, the top of stuff is thin, the bottom of stuff is thick. Um, but the the outer bulges is probably thick you know it it really depends on everything yeah but um you know the the opposite side of where the light is is thicker <laughs> yeah you know um but i i it's good to know the rules so you can break the rules <laughs> exactly. I, I constantly break my own rules and yeah just go go for what looks best sometimes and yeah i was just talking about this the other day with like um tangents like it's good to be aware of tangents but yeah. at some point in your life you're gonna draw a tangent that you don't catch you know it's just gonna happen um but it's better to be aware of it so it's like you can avoid them um yeah i i love that um that helped me a lot when i uh i remember asking a friend of mine who was really good at inking Cause I was looking at, at the time, I think uh, Jeff Smith had finally like finished bone and I was like, how does he get those lines? You know? Cause like, to me, that's a, that's another just like really insane control over his ink kind of guy. And, and like you were well pointing out, it's a really hard style to work in. Cause there's, if you mess up, it's really obvious. Cause there's no, there's nothing hiding anything. <laughs> um, and uh, <clears throat> they kind of, basically described it as um, <clears throat> line weight should depict either, like when you're doing that thick to thin, it, it should be either depicting weight or light in shadow. So it's basically like wherever the weight rests, that's where the thickest part of the line should be. Um, or wherever the, the shadow falls, that's where the thickest, um, like basically wherever the light's furthest from, that's where the thickest lines will be. Um, however, once again, you, you know, usually most people do am amalgamation of both. And then I think after a while, it just kind of becomes intuitive and you just kind of do it. And then every once in a while you break the rule cause it just looks cooler. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, yeah. it's like, um, you know, you see a lot of art that has no weight to the lines and yeah. some of that, some of that art is fantastic. Some of it is pure crap. Yeah. You know, so it's, you know, it's also a whole matter of opinion. Um, but, you know, the thing with when digital inking first arrived, every digital anchor looked like every other digital anchor. And there was, you know, there was no variation of line. It was all thick and chunky. Um, now there's, there's, you know, smarter tools and, and wider ranges of brushes available. And um, now you can really be a true anchor if you're inking digitally yeah uh, if you especially if you know what you're doing <laughs> yeah i think it was similar to that with coloring where when digital coloring first came out it was just like uh, i think everybody was in love with filters and the rainbow that you had effect like you never had access to the full rainbow before you never had access to like every color on the planet and so uh, there was this period of time when digital kind of came into fashion where all color was just like a unicorn just vomited <laughs> and, and it, it looked terrible, you know? Um, but then like, you know, the craft and the, and the, the skill kind of like the, the old laws of color ended up applying and all of these digital artists who like, you know, this happened with graphic design too, when fonts first came out, right? Like where, where it was like fonts came out, I'm a graphic designer. Here's my, here's my menu for your company and curls, you know, like, um, <laughs> but then like once everybody kind of became aware of curls, um, all like 
all, all of those guys, like, you know, like the foundations never change of design. Um, and, and similarly, the foundations of color and the foundations of uh, digital. But it is funny how whenever something kind of comes into fashion, like the first version of it's usually like hideous, you know? Uh. <laughs> like old digital paintings, like early digital paintings really looked digital. Um, and you'll notice like as they get better and better, they start looking more and more traditional, which is what's so great about them, you know? <laughs> yeah. My, my favorite was like, Every uh, in in the first couple of years, everything that was metal looked like '80s airbrushed metal kind of mm. effect, <laughs> and it was like, "Oh, that's horrible." <laughs> it's all the you you see the 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 brown of the ground and the blue of the sky, and there's no other reflection of the ground and sky. You don't see anything else going on. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Uh, well, so we've been going quite a yeah. while, <laughs> um, and so I don't want to keep you too late, but it's been fun um, just having you on to chat. Um, so do you want to really quickly um, just tell us, Peter, where uh, people can find your work? Obviously, we, we'd like to have you back on again because I, I think we can tackle a lot more than just uh, just what we did, but, you know, um, do you want to let people know where they can find you and also – Let's say I'm like somebody who's been watching this and I want to follow along while you uh, finish your your comic for the hundreds. Um, what Where can I kind of watch that, follow that? Well, you, you can follow me everywhere, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube uh, is where I'm at mostly. Um, Peter Palmiotti, just Google me. you find me everywhere. Uh, but Instagram is where you want to go to follow my uh Griffin drawings, uh, and I'll try to um, ink a lot of what I'll be doing going forward. Uh, if I have to rush through, I'll, pe I'll pencil a, a drawing, but I'm going to try to ink a lot more of them. And I'll be using a combination of brush and quill, so look forward to that. <laughs> nice. I I think we maybe we could do like an art casters where we just maybe Scott and I can just get out of the quills. <laughs> And you can just tell us what to do, and we'll yeah. look like kids. We'll just be like, I have no idea what the hell you're talking about, man. Yeah, that <laughs> but, would be um, fun. I think that would actually make a good episode. So let's 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 commit to that. At at some point, we'll have you back on for for some quill lessons. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you again for for joining us, man. It's it's um it's been a pleasure, and and it sounds like people in the chats dug it too. Uh, Mike was saying it's a great episode. Good show, guys. And then uh, Keeman said, I think this was a very great um, topic and discussion. So I think it's much appreciated. Um, all right. Well, so you're on my channel. You guys know where to find me. Um, you're, they, you're here. So just subscribe and then, uh, you know, hit that bell so you're notified every time we go live. But, um, oh, and check out my, I was going to transition and I forgot I didn't plug my own comic. So you should check out my graphic novel that I've been working on for quite a few years. Um, that's posting at quarterlystories.com. And if you're so inclined to like check it out on your phone or something like that, um, you can check it out at um, tapas.io by searching for quarterly stories and adding it to your library there. It's it's a comic I hand letter, hand write, hand ink, and then hopefully hand to you someday in print um, about faith and mental illness. And I think you guys would dig it. So And it's all hand inked. Um, and hand lettered so uh, with 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 ink and brush as we've been discussing so anyhow speaking of that um, if you hit that bell you're gonna notice that like you're not always gonna hear um, when the art casteries goes live because it's not always on my channel it's it's on Scott's channel it's on my channel sometimes hell like maybe Scott and I both will get sick and it'll be on Corey's channel who knows <laughs> so so um, how are you going to keep track of this crazy curveball of like of updates and stuff uh, for for our show, Scott? And also, when it when I'm working on that comic, um, where am I going to get my free assets? <laughs> okay, so we'll start off with the free assets. For those, uh, if you want to create comics and you uh, want some cool tools in order to help you create comics, you just go to circworks.com, download the Comic Maker Starter Kit filled with uh, brushes and 
templates, uh, fonts, just tons of stuff for making comics. So you can go there and download that at circlebooks.com. Uh, and the other thing, if you want to know when we're going to be, now here, here's something I'm going to throw out here, and I might start talking about this in the beginning because I don't know how many people stick around for the whole show or not. But um, I'm curious because the the newsletter for uh, Artcasters it hasn't really grown much, and I'm wondering if that's because people are finding that it seems like YouTube is real bad at, at a lot of things, but one, th one thing that I think is it seems like they're good at is notifying people when you, we go live. Yeah. So if you guys don't mind us, mind letting us know, are you getting your, are you getting your alerts from YouTube or are you, or are you getting them from the newsletter? Because I'm just wondering if maybe the newsletter is kind of superfluous at this point. Yeah, um, I get it. I get them from the newsletter when I. Oh, you catch do? okay, them. okay. Well, well, everyone else, let let us know too. So you know, I'm just. I mean, I don't mind keeping the newsletter up, but I just want to make sure that you know if you know no one's really unsubscribed to it. So I don't think anyone's like, well, this isn't working. But I'm just just curious. But assuming we keep the newsletter going, that's the way you find out where we're going to be. Because uh, like Josh said, we switch back and forth from his channel, my channel, sometimes different days. Um, usually the same time though. But anyway, if you want to know when we're going to be, join the newsletter, and usually about thirty minutes ahead of time, we send that out. We let you know when to when to sign on and everything like that, and where we're going to be. So that's nice. that. All right, cool. Um, and I just think it's insane you're giving that away for free. So you guys, before he comes to his senses, go to go to his site, subscribe to his his newsletter. It's uh, it's insane that he's giving away that starter kit for free. It's a good one. Um, uh, okay, so thanks again to Peter. Oh, by the way, Keeman uh, says that she wants to see more of your work when you're using the quill pen, and I'm I'm super intrigued. And I think I think we'll have to do a full out quill quill pen episode um, just to kind of show off that stuff. But anyhow, thanks to everybody who joined us in the chats, um, and thanks again uh, for kind of bearing with us through this whole conversation. It was super fun. Oh, there's some quill. You got to talk, yeah. Peter. Yeah, this is Quill. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. That's beautiful. All right. Um, so, yeah, so th that's a little teaser for when we have Peter back to teach uh, Scott and I some skills with the Quill. All right. We will uh, see you guys next week. And, oh, I forgot. None of us have said it. Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, guys. yeah. Yeah. Happy yeah. Valentine's Day. <laughs> All right. So thanks. It, uh, at some places, it's probably not Valentine's Day anymore, but it's almost not Valentine's Day here anymore. That's, a, that's, <laughs> that's, a, fair, uh, that's a fair point. Happy after Valentine's Day. But anyhow, I hope you guys had a good one if you're watching this after the fact. And if you aren't, I hope you will have a good uh, Valentine's night. All right. Uh, we will see you guys later. Bye. Later, everyone. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's not stopping. <laughs> okay. There we go. Boom. Mine still says live. <laughs>